church, we're so glad that you're here. So many beautiful smiling faces. Hey, I want to invite you if you can to go ahead and stand to your feet with us this morning. We got a song that's uh, that's new for New Spring. It's not a new song. It's by one of our uh, favorite bands. They wrote a song and it asked a lot of great questions inside of the song and it gives a very simple answer. And it's one that I think is gonna be encouraging for all of us today. I know for myself, I need to be reminded if there's ever a time in my life that I feel like, man, nobody cares about this, nobody cares about me. I can remember what God's word tells me, not what I feel, but what I know. And that is that Jesus loves me. He loves me, he cares about me. He has a plan for my life to prosper me. So this morning as we enter into this time together of worship and reflection, we're gonna do so with gratitude and thanksgiving. We're gonna count the blessings of our lives and remember, Jesus cares. He's still working, he's still moving. We're gonna celebrate that today. So if you know it, we want you to sing it along with us now. Well, who tells the sun to rise every morning? Colors the sky with the shades of his glory. Wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Thank you, Lord. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, and fears every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus does.
We all experience a situation we wish we didn't have to. We think, if only I could find some way to go around it, or maybe go back and avoid it. But by that point, there's only one way to go, and that's through. One of the first hospital visits I ever made working at New Spring. This has been about 13 years ago. Uh, a young couple in our church had just had a baby and they wanted us to, they wanted a pastor to come and uh, pray a prayer of gratitude and thanksgiving for this new little one that had arrived. So uh, I drove over to the hospital, was in the maternity building there, um, went to the, the maternity waiting room, which is an interesting place. Um, lots, lots happening, lots happening in the maternity waiting room. Uh, so I go over there and I'm, I'm, I let the, the nurses at the nurse's station know uh, I'm here to see this 
family and they went to go make sure they were ready for me and all that. So I'm just waiting. And in rolls, they, they roll this lady in on a wheelchair who's obviously in pain, obviously in labor, right? And she's doing all the intake and insurance and stuff. And, and, uh, but you could tell, like, she was really hurting, you know? And her husband's standing right next to her, he, you know? And she reaches over and grabs him by the arm and wrenches him over. Like, I thought she was gonna pull his arm out of the socket. I really did. Now his ear is like right here by her face. And she says, I don't wanna do this anymore. <laughs> and I, I saw the looks on everybody's faces in the waiting room there. It's an interesting thing, the look on everyone's face, because on the one hand, you could tell all of us felt so bad for her because none of us wanna trade places with her right now. None of us wanna do what she's gotta do now, right? None of, none of us wanna go through what she's getting ready to go through. On the other hand, there's part of the look that's on everybody's face that's like, but we know she's gonna have to, you know? We know that she doesn't really have a choice. Like, you're, you're there, you're gonna have to go through it now. And that's what we're talking about in this series. There are things that you're gonna arrive at in life where you're gonna get to the point where you're like, I don't wanna do this anymore. Like, I now realize how big this is gonna be in my life. I realize how difficult this is gonna be, what I'm gonna have to go through. And I, I, don't, I think I bargain for more than I can handle. And we feel that overwhelmed feeling of, I just don't wanna do this anymore. And yet we know, there's no getting out of it now. I'm gonna have to go through this. And we've been talking about different life circumstances where that's the case, but today I wanna to talk about a very specific case, and that is when you go through the loss of a loved one, a, a family member, a spouse, a, somebody that's a very close friend to you, um, because that's a, that is a, a, a through at a whole other level. When you're going through the loss of a loved one, the pain of that, I think there's so many in this room that could, could attest to the fact the pain of that is at another level. It's at a whole other level. Now, by the way, there may be some of you in this room that are going, you know what? I don't need today's message because I'm not really going through this. I, I, I haven't recently been through the loss of a loved one. And if that's the case, you are so blessed. It's a wonderful thing that that's not something that's part of your story right now. But can I tell you, you still need today's talk because if the Lord doesn't come back first, you will experience this at some point. All of us need to be prepared for the fact that at some point we're gonna have to say goodbye to somebody that we love. And beyond all of that, it's even bigger than that. Even if you're not going through the loss of a loved one right now, can I tell you that somebody in your sphere is, somebody in your sphere of influence is going through a loss. And being the right kind of person to help them through their grief is the best gift you can possibly give them because there are a lot of people that will make their grief worse. And so we're gonna talk about not only going through that valley of grief, but how you can help those who are going through that as well. Now, in our, in our beginning, just sort of getting our framework lined up for where we're gonna be today, I wanna take you to Psalm 23, verse four. This is a verse that I've read um, at, at gravesides and funerals that I've done now for years. I'll be reading this verse at a funeral I'll be, I'll be doing on Wednesday. Um, the psalmist says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Now, if you memorize this in the King James, as most of us did, you probably memorized it as, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? And I've heard a lot of pastors preach about this, like, even when I get to the point in my life where I face death, I'm not gonna be afraid. Frankly, that's probably not the the, the best interpretation of what the psalmist is saying here. First of all, this is, the, this is probably the best rendering of what the original language says, when I walk through the darkest valley. As a matter of fact, biblical language scholars tell us it's like a superlative on top of a superlative on top of a superlative. It's like, even when I go through the darkest, darkest, dark valley, is really what's being said there. And there is a sort of hint implied in the language of death. Um, and so, a lot of Bible scholars believe, and I believe, that David isn't talking about his own death. He's talking about going through the valley of having to deal with the death of somebody that you care very much about. And like I said, I think so many folks in this room could attest to the fact that's like the hardest thing you've ever been through. You've been, maybe you've been sick before, you've dealt with illness, you've dealt with financial challenges, you've dealt with relationship issues, but you could probably immediately say, no, losing somebody that you love and having to say goodbye to them and go through the funeral and, and dealing with the aftermath of it and the special days and how do you deal with Thanksgiving and how do you deal with Christmas and how do you deal with their birthday and how do you just deal with, with the aftermath of that person not being there? You could say, that was the darkest, that was the darkest, darkest, dark thing for me. And David is saying, here's the thing, even when I go through that, I'm gonna be okay, because God is gonna be with me. And as a matter of fact, if you're going through grief, and the only thing you hear me say in this entire message is this, this would be worth coming. If you're going through grief, you're gonna be okay, because God is gonna go through it with you. 
You don't have to do this alone. And grief is a lonely, it's a lonely experience. When you have to say goodbye to that person that you care about so much, it's a, it's a lonely making thing. You feel lonely, but the, but the Bible tells us that you're not alone. As we're gonna talk about at the very end of this message, the Bible says that God is particularly close to the brokenhearted. And when you go through a difficult season, God is, he, he's more with you when you're dealing with that broken heart from grief than at any other time. But I, I wanna give this as a practical talk. Uh, as uh, having focused for the last couple years on, on grief, very much as we're developing a new grief program here at New Spring, we call it Through This Valley. As I've been doing that, I, I've been trying to focus on what is practical. What are the things that we can do to really make it through when we're grieving? And so I wanna share with you three things that you're gonna need when you're going through your darkest valley. The first thing that you're gonna need is a lot of patience. You need a lot of patience. And, and especially you're gonna need patience with yourself. Because if you're somebody like me who likes to just zip through things, like when I was in college and I was trying to get my degrees done, I would try to double up on classes. Anything that I could do to get to the finish line first. I always wanna finish fast and I wanna finish first, right? I wanna, I wanna find a way to zip through things. But there is no zipping through grief. You're not gonna just get there quickly. Grief doesn't work that way. There are no shortcuts. You know, we used to think that that, that grief behaved itself in an orderly way and it had stages, you know? The idea of uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, we had these five stages of grief and the idea was you would go through these one at a time, you might get stuck in one or the other, but eventually you get through all five stages and the idea was that grief behaved itself like that. Can I tell you that grief is not like that? We know now from empirical science that the five stage theory is bunk. It does not work that way. Grief is unique to the person who experienced it. It, it. it is very different for every person. It is messy and it takes a while. It, it takes years. The, if, if you were very close to the person that you lost, it will take you years to, to, to go through the, the bulk of your grieving process. Not weeks, not months. It'll take years to go through the bulk of that grieving process. So there's gotta be patience with yourself and patience with how you process it because you'll process it different than the next person. Some of us, we need to talk about our grief. And, and, and if you go through a specific kind of loss, a traumatic loss, you may need to tell the story several times of how you lost this person. You may, have to, to, you, you may need somebody in your life who's willing to hear the same thing over and over a little bit. You, you may just need to verbally process it some. Some of us are not verbal processors and we need to process it on the inside. And you need somebody who's just gonna sit with you as you process it. You need somebody just to be a compassionate presence as you work through it. Some of us, we need to have reminders all over the place of the person uh, that, that died so that we we are comforted by that. Others of us, those reminders are very difficult in the early days and we need to not see those things. Everybody's a little bit different. So we not, we not only need to be patient with others and the way they grieve, we need to be patient with ourselves and recognize that I cannot shoehorn my grief into anybody else's process. I can't shoehorn my grief into anybody else's timeline. Just because the next person says they're able to grieve in 12 months doesn't mean that if I'm still grieving 18 months later, I've somehow messed up. Just because they need to experience an emotional thing a certain way doesn't mean that my emotions have to mirror what their emotions are. It is a unique thing and it is a journey that I walk with God. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. God will walk with me through my unique grieving process. I think that's why David was saying, this is what it's gonna be like for me. I will be okay because even though I'm different than everybody else, the one thing I can trust is that God will walk with me as I go through it. Now, what does the Bible say about patience. In, in uh, Romans, the apostle Paul says, we need to rejoice in hope, but what are we supposed to do in suffering? What is our attitude supposed to be in suffering? Patience. We're supposed to be patient in suffering. Well, now now that, that seems oxymoronic, doesn't it? Like in suffering, you just want to get out. When you're in pain, you want the pain to end. That's normal. That's natural. That's how it's supposed to be. So to be patient in pain, that doesn't quite seem to work. Why, why are we saying that we need to be patient in pain? Because ultimately, the pain of this loss is something that you will not be able to avoid. At some point, you will have to deal with it. And so we can either be patient with it and take it a day at a time. And that's really what the idea here is of being patient. It means to hang in there, to take it one day at a time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna accept this pain as it comes. I'm gonna ride the waves of pain. And if you've been through loss, you know what I'm talking about, that the pain and the sadness comes like waves, almost like when, you, when you've waded into the ocean just enough that the ocean begins to pick you up and set you down and pick you up and set you down. That's what the waves of pain and sadness are kind of like. And, and at, at some point you have to say, all right, I'm gonna ride these waves. I'm gonna go through the the process of doing my grief work today and then I'm going to do my grief work tomorrow and then I'm going to do my grief work the next day because avoiding it doesn't work. 
to hang in there. By the way, we sang a song earlier, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And there's a phrase in that song that says, peace that endureth, right? So God is asking me to endure through pain, but God doesn't ask me to endure through pain without his resources. He's saying, in the pain that you're in, as you endure through pain, my peace is gonna endure with you. The Bible talks about the peace that passeth understanding, right, in the KJV, peace that passeth understanding. I used to think that meant like passeth the potatoes, like the peace that God passes over to you, right? That's not what pass means there. This means like pass, like when you pass somebody on K96. It means to overtake, it means to get there first. That God's peace in our pain gets there before we understand our pain. It gets there before we understand our experience, before we can make sense of it. God's peace gets there first. It, it passes understanding. And so while others might need an explanation, we, don't, we, we can say, I can endure this pain because God's peace has been getting there. I've been feeling God's peace day at a time as I go through this. So how do you hang in there? Well, I've already been saying the first part of this, which is to take it one day at a time. I like to kill two birds with one stone. I like to do as many things, and, and I'm, that's efficiency to me. Do as many things at once as you possibly can. But there is no efficiency expert treatment of grief. You cannot figure out how to do, you know, and I've talked to people that are like that. Jonathan, I'll take two months off of work if you'll tell me what book I need to read, what video I need to go through, what program I need to do, so long as at the end of it, I know I'll be done grieving. It just doesn't work that way. You gotta take it one day at a time, and sometimes one task at a time. If you lose a loved one, you may find yourself needing to make a checklist for tomorrow. Like when that loved one dies today, tomorrow you may have to write yourself a checklist where it says get out of bed, brush your teeth, take a shower, have breakfast, go to the mortuary, talk to the funeral director, come home, take a nap, have lunch, because there are seasons of life where the, the grief is so burdensome, right? We call this grief brain, by the way. It, it even messes with our thinking. We, we just struggle even to just remember basic things. Where did I set my keys? Where, where am I supposed to be now? What am I supposed to be doing now? But the fog of that loss just being over our head the whole time makes it hard to just even do daily stuff. And because of that, there's a season of life where you have to just take it one task at a time, one small thing. What is the next thing that I'm supposed to do? And eventually you'll be able to take it one day at a time. As time goes on, you'll begin to start thinking about what am I going to do over the next couple days? And eventually you'll start to be thinking about what am I going to do this week? But not, not initially. When you're going through the pain of grief, you need to take it one day at a time. The Bible tells us that, that today's trouble is enough for today. When I go to the gym and work out, which as you can tell is not often, um, I look at those weights over there and I realize I can lift a thousand pounds over several days and a lot of reps, you know? Um, but if I go in there and try to lift a thousand pounds all at once, I will injure myself. See where I'm going with this? That what happens, a lot of people wanna lift the weight of grief all at once. I just wanna get past it, I just wanna do, and what they, they end up making it worse, they end up injuring themselves because ultimately I can only lift so much today and then tomorrow I'll be able to lift some and then the next day I'll be able to lift some and the next day I'll be able to lift some and God is gonna be with me as I do it one step at a time, one day at a time. The second thing is in, in terms of patience is taking care of yourself. You need to take care of yourself and what happens when we go through grief is we become so burdened by the emotional energy that it takes to grieve that we start to forget to take care of our physical health. And then because our physical health starts to suffer, our grieving process becomes so much harder. We need to have that energy. We need to have that wellness. And there's three things that you absolutely cannot ignore. They're the three-legged tripod of physical health, which is diet, sleep, and exercise. I need to make sure that I'm eating healthy, I need to make sure that I'm getting good sleep. If I'm not getting good sleep, I need to see my physician. And I need to make sure that I'm getting up and moving around. When I say exercise, I don't mean, you know, when you just lost a loved one, make sure that you're going to the gym every day. What I'm saying is make sure you're getting up and moving around. Maybe, maybe just take a walk around the block. Do something to make sure that you're, you're, you're getting some basic exercise, you're eating well, you're sleeping well. Those are non-negotiables. You need to take care of yourself. And that's especially true if you've been a long-term caregiver. Because what happens with long-term caregivers is as the person that they're caring for gets more and more ill, often what happens is their own physical health becomes more and more pushed to the back burner and they don't think about it very much and so they don't get the physical that they need to get and they don't have the blood test that they need to get and they're not doing all of the things that you would normally do to take care of yourself. And so when you go through loss, that's the perfect time to evaluate what do I need to do to make sure that I'm taking care of myself physically because you need that in order to be able to grieve well. 
Third, you need to cooperate with the pain. And what I mean by that is you have two options, right? You have either the option to do the work, like, like I said earlier, do the grief work that today brings. Today's gonna bring this grief work. I'm gonna go through this emotion that I'm feeling today and I've gotta process the emotion that I'm feeling today and I'm gonna process you know, the different things that are triggers for me today and I'm gonna kinda work through, that's my grief work for today. I'm gonna work on what comes today. I can either cooperate with the pain and do that or I can try to avoid it. But here's the most important thing I can tell you about avoidance. Avoiding pain doesn't make it go away, it just postpones it. It's like swiping a credit card. The bill will eventually come due at some point. That pain is still gonna be there. And I've worked with so many people who've, used, um, who've, who've abused drugs or they've used alcohol as a way to avoid the pain of loss, but eventually that pain is still there and now they have a drug problem and now they have an alcohol problem. Or, and maybe on a more innocent plane, I've seen people that have said, you know what, I, I, I just, I can't be around anything that reminds me of that person. So I'm gonna get rid of their house and I'm gonna get rid of their car and I'm gonna get rid of all their stuff and I don't, want to see, I, don't, I don't want to see anything that makes me think of them because I just can't handle that. And so they, they make all these huge changes and up in their life and then they're back in my office six months later and they're saying, I sure wish I hadn't gotten rid of the house. And the things that they actually need to go through the grieving process, they've gotten rid of. See, avoidance just postpones our pain. The, the, there is a, a spirit in which we say, God, I am, I am ill-equipped to deal with this pain and I want to avoid it, but I need you to help me face it. I need you to help me, I need you to help me cooperate with the pain. And God will do that. We need to give God a chance to go through the pain with us. That's the important thing. We can make it through it. We can choose not to avoid the pain by saying, God, I'm going to need you to go through this with me. Just like the psalmist said, I'll fear no evil because God is with me. We were in Kansas City, my wife and I, uh, several weeks ago, just as a um, get away for us, and nothing special, just hanging out in Kansas City. And uh, we went over to Union Station. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's an amazing building. It used to be a train station there and lots of cool stuff uh, that they have over in Union Station. And we were going down this escalator. You're getting ready to go down this escalator down to the lower floor. And it is kind of a big escalator, big drop there. And there was a young family in front of us and mom had a, a baby in a car carrier that she was carrying. I mean, this is a busy, busy young family. Dad had a diaper bag and all this stuff. And he's holding onto the hand of this maybe five-year-old, four or five-year-old little boy. And uh, they, they get onto the escalator. I can see dad is sort of gingerly trying to, you know, do this because get, get everything on, get my son on the escalator. And it starts to crest the top and starts to go down. And this little boy turns loose of his dad's hand and runs back about 20 steps. And now I realize he is terrified of this escalator. I don't think he's ever been on an escalator before. And, um, but dad is going down. Like dad was already, like he's on his, he's on his way down. And my, my wife, who is the most sweet, kind person, and also just somebody who, who is able to help in moments like that. She's always somebody who has a heart to help somebody when they're struggling. She walks up to this little boy and she says, is everything okay? And he looked up at her and he said, I'll never be able to do this. It just pulls on my heartstrings when I think of this little kid saying, because he's saying, I just, this is too scary for me. And my wife said to him, I tell you what, why don't we go down together and, and, and you hold my hand and you just look at me, don't look down. And I'm watching as this little boy and my wife are going down the escalator and this little boy is looking up at my wife the whole time. That's what God wants to do for you. You're gonna get to a moment where you're gonna say, God, I'm never gonna be able to do this. You're gonna be in a funeral home sitting across from a funeral director talking about arrangements. And in your head, you're gonna be thinking, God, I'm never gonna be able to do this. And yet, you know you have to go through. You know you have to do it. And God is saying, look, we'll do this together. You just hold my hand and you look at me. You don't look down. That's why David was saying, I'll be okay. I'll be okay because God is gonna go through this with me. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, it says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I'll not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. What is the rod and staff? What is that all about? Because I had a Bible professor back in Bible college who had all this symbolism. Oh, this is what the rod is and this is what the staff is. It was very complicated and very symbolic and I don't believe any of that. David was a shepherd and I think he understood that there would be moments when his sheep would not see him necessarily, but they would see his rod and staff leaning up against the rock and they would know that he was there. 
When my, when my wife or my daughter drive by the church and they see my blue sedan out front, they know I'm here. They don't need to see me. They just see that sign of my presence and they know that I'm here. And I think David was saying, there are gonna be, yes, there are gonna be moments in grief where I just, I'm like, where is God in all of this? But God is gonna leave these signs of his presence. And I think anybody who's been through grief and you've walked through it with God, you would say, God just kept leaving things for me to realize he was there with me and I wasn't doing this alone that God is saying, just look at me. We're gonna do this together. Just look at me. Don't look down and we're gonna do this. Patience, that's the first thing you need. The second thing that you're gonna need is you're gonna need some safe people because people can make or break your grief experience. There are some people that will mean well but will make your grief way worse. And there are other people that are safe and that are, are people that you need to welcome into your world to help you go through the process of grieving. And, and one example of this idea that some people are helpful and some people are not, you'll find in the book of Job. I, I don't have time to go into the whole story of Job, but if you're interested in a sermon series that goes through the whole story, my dad did a, a sermon series in 2008 called Silence, and it's an amazing three-message series on Job. And you can just go to newspring.org slash silence and watch it right there. But I just want to cut into the middle of the story because in, in the story of Job, you know that Job is going through these terrible things that are not his fault. Job has not offended God. He's not done anything that God is trying to punish him for. And yet Job goes through the loss of his wealth. He goes through the, the death of his children. And then he goes through the loss of his health. Now he's covered in boils and sores. He's living in a garbage dump, taking things out of the garbage to, to scrape against his sores, trying to get any kind of relief he can get. And he is as, as far away from the nice life that he used to have. Now he's in a terrible, miserable life. And his friends show up to, quote unquote, help him. Now, I gotta, I gotta hand it to him. At first, they did okay. As a matter of fact, at first, they did really well. In Job 2, it says, then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights, and no one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. Hey, if that's all they had done, they would have done a good job. Because I know a lot of people that can't even do that. I know a lot of people that aren't comfortable with moments of silence when they're with somebody who's going through a difficult time. But let me tell you, if you're with a grieving person and you're gonna try to help them, you need to become comfortable with moments of silence because there are moments when words will not help and your presence is the important message. But if you talk, you will actually undo the important message that your presence is there to send. See, the thing is, Job's friends did fine until they opened their mouth. And for some of us, that's what we have to be very careful about. We need to make sure that we're only talking in a situation like this if we really know what to say because there are plenty of people who don't know what to say and they say it anyway. I was talking to a, a couple who had been through a miscarriage. This has been several years ago at New Spring. I was talking to a couple who's going through a miscarriage and really grieving over it. And uh, they had a, uh, a, another couple that was friends with them who came up and sort of joined the conversation as we were having this talk. And uh, the other lady, so the, the friend said, you know, there, there is a bright side to this. At least you didn't have this child as an infant to fall in love with. Oh and it is things like that that people say they just didn't think. And it's like sticking a knife in and twisting it. And so it's really important, right, that to have safe people that will listen instead of talking because so often when we talk, we actually do damage because we don't know what to say. And so really a safe person is somebody who's, who's gonna listen. But in, unfortunately, uh, Job's friends did a lot of talking. In their tiny view of God, people only go through difficult things if they offend God. And if they don't offend God, then they have a good life on earth. And by the way, there are people who think that there are televangelists you'll find on TV all the time that sort of pitch that idea. Problem is, it just doesn't work out logically and it's not biblical, right? We live in a broken world. There are some people that feel like everything that happens on this earth is God's will. And so God has a reason for everything. So if a person dies of cancer, that was God's will and God has a reason for it. If a person is robbed at gunpoint, that was still God's will and God has a reason for it. God has the ends justifies the means philosophy. Someday God will tell us why all these things happen. That is so unbiblical. We live in a broken world. Our world is impacted by sin. This is, not the, this is not how God had intended it to be. And so we deal with goodbyes and sickness and illness and death, but God grieves over that just as we grieve over that. How did, how did God teach us to pray? What did Jesus tell us to pray? Your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven is where God's will is always done. Earth is where God's will is sometimes done, but heaven is where God's will is always done. And so what happens though is Job, Job's friends are thinking though, no, no, God, 
God is doing this to you because God has a reason. You must have really ticked God off. And so they try to explain that to him. One of Job's friends says this in Job 8, how long will you go on like this? You sound like a blustering wind. Does God twist justice? Does the Almighty twist what is right? Your children must have sinned against him so their punishment was well-deserved. Can you imagine saying that to a father who's lost 10 children? One of his other friends said this, if only God would speak, if only he would tell you what he thinks, if only he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for true wisdom is not a simple matter. Listen, God is doubtless punishing you far less than you deserve. With friends like that, who needs enemies, right? And then his third friend gets spiritual, because that's what people do. When they really run out of things to say, they get spiritual. And sometimes people will use a, 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 a spiritual idea as a dig, and that's what one of his friends did. He said, is God's comfort too little for you? Is his gentle word not enough? Hey, I've heard this before. I've heard people say, you know what, if you just had faith, if you had more faith, you wouldn't be grieving. If you had more faith, you wouldn't be weeping like this. If you had more faith, you wouldn't be going through this day after day. If you had more faith, you would, if you could just get a glimpse of what they were like in heaven right now, you would be so happy. That is not true. We're not grieving for the person who's died. We understand they're healthy and well and in heaven. We're grieving because we miss them. And if we didn't miss them, that would be, it is an honor to grieve them. It, is, it shows how much we appreciated the person that they, that they were. We understand that they're on deposit with Jesus and someday we'll be reunited with them. But for now, it's sad that we don't get to be present with them here on earth. And it's okay for us to be sad. That's not a lack of faith. That is an appreciation of the gift that God gave us in that person. Two things, the right kind of person will listen to your experience instead of offering explanations. The right kind of person will understand that to explain this to you is beyond their pay grade. I have people that will call me up and they'll say, Pastor Jonathan, uh, a friend of mine, you know, their husband just died and I just need to know what to say. What is the right thing to say? And that is the wrong question. But think about it, That's, isn't that what comes to our mind? I just need to know what to tell them. I just need to know what to say to them. But the truth is there is nothing that I can say that will, will change what they're going through. There's nothing that I can say that will be some sort of magic you know, uh, balm that will make this feel better for them. Ultimately, the best thing I can do is to be there and care. And the best way that I can show that I care is to listen. We were putting together this grief program and, and interviewing some of the nation's greatest Christian psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists. I asked all of them, how do I know if somebody is a safe person for me to grieve with? You know what the number one answer is? Will they listen to you? Will they just let you talk? Second thing is the right kind of person will feel some of what you're going through instead of trying to fix what you're going through. Isn't, there a, isn't it true there's a compulsion to fix? I just wanna make this right for you. I wanna make it go away for you. I, wanna, I don't wanna see you in this kind of pain. It hurts me to see you in pain. Yeah, it is painful for me too, but I should not fight to avoid the pain of seeing them go through this any more than they should fight the pain of going through this loss. That is the point. We need to be able to experience this pain together. I've, I've had people say to, you know, to somebody that they love who is grieving, when is the, re when is the real you gonna come back? When, when are you gonna be back to normal? I know you lost this person and I know you're grieving, but when are you gonna be back to the normal you? When are you gonna be back to the old you? And the answer is they're not. They're not gonna be back to the old them. They will eventually come to a new normal and it will be a good new normal, but they're never gonna be the person that they used to be. But what, the reason that we're asking them, when are you gonna be back to the old you is we're uncomfortable with the pain of seeing what they're going through. But we need to face that just as they need to face what they're going through. And I need to understand that I can't fix it. One thing I've learned working around the house, especially as plumbing, especially as far as plumbing and electricity are, are concerned, if I try to fix something but I don't fully understand it, I'll generally make it worse. And that's what happens. We wanna fix what somebody's going through in grief and, and we try to, but we don't really understand what they're going through and we accidentally make it worse. You're gonna need patience. You're gonna need people, and you're gonna need perspective. The Bible tells us that as Christians, we are not to grieve as those who have no hope. There are some Christians that wanna put the period after we're not to grieve, to act as though God didn't give us these tear ducts for a reason, but he did. They wanna act as though we should just walk on and act like we didn't experience a loss, 
but that's just another form of avoiding the grief. Ultimately, God never told us we're to not grieve. He just said we're not to grieve as those who have no hope. We're not to grieve as those who don't have perspective, who can't look at this and say there is more to this than what I see when I go to the mortuary. There is more, more to this than what I see when we go to the cemetery. There is more to this than what I see when we pull out the Christmas ornaments and we're putting them on the tree and I realize that person isn't here to help them put, help put them on the tree. This person isn't here to carve the Thanksgiving turkey anymore. This person isn't here to celebrate the birthday party. There is more to this than what is obvious in the moment. There is an eternal reality that is so far beyond what I'm experiencing here right now. There's something more. John 11 is a good example of this. In John 11, Lazarus passes away. And, and Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus. Jesus had these three friends in Bethany he would stay with whenever he was passing through. Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Lazarus gets sick while Jesus is traveling and doing ministry somewhere else. And um, Mary and Martha send off a message. Hey, you need to come back. Lazarus is sick. And Mary and Martha have watched Jesus heal so many people. I truly believe they had tremendous faith Jesus would show up and take care of this. And, and forgive me for breaking a, a point here, but a lot of people think if you have enough faith, God will always show up and heal he will keep bad things from happening to your family. He will heal the person of the sickness. By the way, it's such an earthly view of healing for us to think that. That we think when we pray for God to heal somebody of cancer, if they are not in remission in this earth, they, God somehow didn't heal them. You understand that any healing that I experience on earth is temporary. This body is eventually gonna wear out no matter what. That actually ultimate healing is heaven. When I step into heaven, I'm, so if I pray for God to heal somebody of cancer and they pass away, that does not mean that God said no. That means that God brought out the ultimate healing. Now that person is completely whole and completely well. <laughs> Lazarus died. Despite their faith that he would come, Jesus didn't come. And Lazarus died. Can you imagine what a, what a gut punch that was? And then Martha, I'm assuming it was Martha because she was kind of the... the um, the, the person who managed everything. I bet she managed his burial and all that because they buried very quickly in that culture. So they, they got him put into the grave and then Jesus showed up a couple days late. Martha decides to go out and confront Jesus about this because Martha's like me. She's got no filter. Whatever's in her head's coming out her mouth, you know. And she goes to Jesus and she says, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. There's something in the Psalms that we call a lament psalm. And a lament has to do with how we talk to God about our pain. And you, if you look at lament psalms, David will do this. He will, he, will, he will give God this very gut level, genuine, authentic statement of the pain he's going through. This is what it feels like. This is, this is how I, I feel abandoned and I feel like I'm going through this and I'm in such pain and I don't know my enemies are gonna take over and all this stuff. And then, but... But lament always has a boomerang. On the backside of that, David will then say, but I know this is true about God, and I know this is what I can count on, and I know this is what I can have faith in. That is lament. It is the, the, the dual realities of this is what it feels like, but this is what I know is true. Now, Martha is actually doing this. She is lamenting directly to Jesus. She says, this is what it feels like. It feels like if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And yet, here's the faith message. Even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's not what it says in the, in the Greek. Yes, he will rise again when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Okay, two things. First off, Jesus is saying, Martha, you think resurrection is about a timeline. Because when he said your brother will rise, she said, oh yeah, later, I get that. He's saying, no, resurrection isn't about a timeline. Resurrection is about a person. He's saying, I am the resurrection. Wherever I am, that's where there is life after death. Wherever I am, that is where the, the sting of death doesn't quite sting anymore. Because there is, Jesus holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He's not afraid of the, of, of, you know, I always think about, I, I know a couple of my friends who are uh, funeral directors are here in the service today. And I always think about the, the they call it a church key. There's a key that they'll lock the, the casket with. And I always thought when Jesus talked about, I have the keys to death, hell, and the grave, I always thought there isn't anything that they can lock my body in that he can't get me out of. There's, there's resurrection in knowing Jesus. 
Yeah, that's the thing. Sometimes we forget. Maybe the most important thing about knowing Jesus is Jesus isn't afraid of anything. And because I belong to him, I don't have to be afraid of anything. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Now, in Greek, we can put, we can, we can, we can do something interesting with a word. If you, if you know math, if you're familiar with math, if you're a math person, you know that we can put a line over a three and that three just kind of repeats on because it never quite resolves. In Greek, you can do that with a word. And so what this verse actually says in the original language is, anyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever, 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 on into infinity die. Why the emphasis on this? Because let's face it, it looks like the end, doesn't it? I mean, it's tough. It's tough saying goodbye. And so Jesus is putting a lot of emphasis on this, even though it looks like it. You have to understand, there is, there is an eternal part of me that's never, ever gonna die. You just see the exterior shell, the, the real me, my personality, the me that my family knows and loves, that part of me is gonna go on to live forever and ever. As a matter of fact, Paul put it this way um, in 2 Corinthians. He said, for we know that when this earthly tent that we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. See, the thing is, when you look at me, you don't see the real Jonathan. You just see my tent. And my tent is wearing out. Some of my hair has already gone home to be with the Lord. Um, but this tent is not forever. This tent is a temporary thing. And eventually this tent is going to come down and God is going to put something permanent in its place. In 1995, we had a groundbreaking ceremony right here. We had this big yellow tent right in this spot where we were celebrating the fact that we were gonna build this building. Our, our current property was on the other side of town, so all, we had to make sure we had all the facilities here to have a service right here. And so everything was temporary. We had you know, the temporary tent and temporary gear and everything was, was set up for us to have this service. And it was a glorious service. But you know what didn't happen? What didn't happen is we didn't get together as a church and vote that we had fallen in love with the tent and that was gonna be our new church. This tent is pretty awesome. We're just gonna keep this and we're, gonna, you, we're not gonna take it down. You say, well, Jonathan, you have to take the tent down because if you don't take the tent down, then you can't put the building up. And the building is what is meant to be permanent. The tent was never meant to be permanent. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying at some point, this tent is gonna have to be taken down because God has a permanent plan to replace it. We are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord, for we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we would be two things, then we would be at home with the Lord. We're not at home right now. You know what it's like when you travel, and no, no matter how nice the hotel is that you stay in, no matter how wonderful the, the thing that you've gone to, vacation or whatever, there's no feeling quite like arriving at home and being there. But the thing is, we have never experienced the true at home feeling because the Bible says as long as we're in this world, we're not at home. Someday we're gonna experience the greatest sensation of being at home that we've ever experienced because we will truly be at home. And bonus, the Bible says that when we're at home, we will be with the Lord. He'll be there with us. And what will that be like? Because I've heard some weird things about heaven. I've heard some people say that we're gonna float around on clouds, play harps, that doesn't sound like anything I'm, I'm up for. It's not really my gig. I've heard some people say that heaven's just gonna be one long church service. And growing up as a third generation pastor, going to revivals and tent meetings and stuff, I've been to some services that lasted for an eternity. <laughs> but uh, I'm not really up for that either. See, we have such a narrow view of heaven. Heaven is gonna be everything God wanted this world to be before sin messed it up, plus. Did you know the Bible says that in heaven there are gonna be cities, rivers, gates, trees, fruit, animals, streams of water, dancing, crops, mountains, nations, jewels, banquets, children, music, the list goes on. It's gonna be amazing. You know, they're gonna be, think about all the things that existed before the curse of sin. You remember, God gave Adam a job. There was work before sin ever happened. I think we're gonna work in heaven, I really do. I think we're gonna have work, but I think it's gonna be work without all of the curse of sin impacting it. I think we're gonna, the Bible's clear, we're gonna eat in heaven, but I don't think there are gonna be any calories. <laughs> I'm counting on that. <laughs> we're gonna experience what God intended us to have, but without the rotten part that sin has introduced. The good things that God has taught us to love without the bad things that Satan uses to create difficulties. We need that perspective. And, and in that idea of, of 
grieving with perspective. When we were doing the interviews for our new grief program, one of the video clips um, that I was editing the other day was from my friend Ron Deal, who's a therapist and a pastor. He was talking about the loss of his son. His, his son passed away uh, when he was only 12 years old. And um, Ron was talking about that experience. And he was talking about his perspective and how his faith informs it. And I think it would really be good for you to hear it directly from Ron. So listen to what Ron has to say about his loss. You know, people ask me all the time, other parents who have lost a child like us, they, they want to know if they're going to feel this bad forever. I sit here today as a minister and therapist and also a grieving father. Before my son died, he was 12 when he died. Before that, I found myself in a role of counseling some people after a school shooting and one of their children was killed, tragically. And I had a long-standing relationship with this family and the parent in particular. And she said something to me one day when we were talking. She said, my whole world is gray. I just don't know what to do with that. And I remember sitting there as a therapist in that moment thinking, I know she's saying something deeply profound and I also know I do not understand it. I am not getting my head and heart around her level of pain. But I'll never forget that moment. In fact, I use that as an illustration in training some other people to help them think about grief and that, all that. Fast forward 10 years, my son dies. People see it on social media, it's all over the place. This mom reaches out to me. She has no idea that I have used those words from her, my world is gray, as an illustration. And through the years, I've repeated them over and over in different contexts. She has no idea I've done that. She reaches out to me on Facebook and she says to me, Ron, I once told you that my world was gray. And I want you to know with God's help, the color comes back. I mean, the counselee becomes the counselor. She was, as Corinthians says, she was sharing with me the comfort that God had given her. She's now sharing that on with me. And it was such an incredibly moving moment for me. And it meant so much. Here's a parent who has walked this journey. She's not belittling my sadness. She's not saying, okay, come on, it's time to move on. She is saying, I get it. It's a long road. It is a marathon. But somewhere in the journey, God brings the color of your life back. It doesn't mean I'm happy about my son being gone. It doesn't mean that everything is okay now. But it does mean that the burden of that intensity lifts. It does mean I can raise my head up again. I find my smile again. I'm able to laugh again. All, all things I couldn't do for a long time. I didn't hear my wife laugh for a year and a half after our son died. And here it is 10 years later, she's telling me, it's gonna be okay. Keep walking, keep trusting God. Um, so today is day 4,595 since my son died. I, uh, other family members got tattoos to remember and honor Connor and carry him with me. I, I wear this. Uh, he and I love Mountain Dew, <laughs> so it's Mountain Dew green, and it's way I just carry him with me every day, and I count days. And I actually think there's a part of me that thinks, boy, that's a little weird. <laughs> it's a little morbid. Why are you counting days? What's that all about? I'm not sure I can give you an explanation. It's been a long time since I've seen him and talked to him, and I miss him. But I also count days because I know there's a day I get to quit counting. And I don't know how many, how high I'm gonna have to count, but one of these days, I don't have to count anymore. So in a way I'm counting up and in a way I'm counting down. Because I don't know what has happened most of the time, and I certainly don't know why this has happened, but I do know who. I do know who holds eternity, and I do know who is gonna make this right. 
And I'm counting down to that. I mentioned this verse at the beginning of the talk, but this is in Psalms 34. It's an anchor verse for us for grief ministry. And that is that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you feel crushed in your spirit, God is with you. That's why David said it would be okay. He said, it'll be all right. It'll be okay, because God's gonna be with me as I go through this. It's not gonna be easy. It's not, it's not gonna be painless, but it's gonna be okay. And I'm gonna make it through this. And God is gonna be with me as I go through this. You're gonna, you're gonna need to be patient. Patient with yourself, patient with others, patient with the process. You're gonna need some safe people who are gonna listen to you a lot and who are gonna care about meeting your needs instead of trying to fix your problem. And then you're gonna need a perspective because we're not to grieve as those who have no hope. We know that there's more to this than what we can see. Pray with me, would you please? Father, I pray especially for those in this room that are going through loss. I pray that you would give them comfort in their spirit, that you would give them the ability to, to heal from what they've been through. Father, thank you for those that they've had to say goodbye to and the incredible impact that they've made on this world. And I pray as they grieve those losses that you would walk along with them in a way that they can feel, that they can know that you're present with them. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. If you'd say, Jonathan, you know what? As you talked about heaven, I, I realize this is something I need to get settled. I, I wanna know for sure that if I were to step out into eternity that I would go to heaven and I want my family to know that's where I'm gonna be. If anything happens to me, I'm, I'm gonna be in heaven and I, I wanna have a relationship with the God that you've been talking about in this message. If that's you, I want you to know the good news here is that God has done all the heavy lifting, all the hard work has been done. He only looks now for you to determine whether or not you wanna be in a relationship with him. He, he cannot say yes for you to a relationship because a forced relationship is no relationship at all. He just wants to know, do you want to be, it's not about joining a church, it's not about giving to this or that. It's about saying, do you wanna be a member of God's family? Do you wanna follow Jesus? And if you do, you could make that decision right now. I'm gonna say the words to a real simple prayer that you could use to say to God that you wanna be a member of his family. And you can say this silently, you don't even have to say it out loud. But here's that prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died and came back to life for me. I know I do wrong things. I know I'm incapable of getting to heaven on my own, but I know that you love me. I'm asking you for forgiveness and I'm asking you to make me God's child. I wanna follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look this way, just really quickly, if you would, everyone look this way. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I wanna, I wanna congratulate you for making the most important decision of your life. And we wanna help you as you get started in your new journey with God. We've got a box of materials we'd like to give you. You can either text the word PRAYED to 97,000 and we'll make sure that we uh, get it to you or you can just go straight to guest services and they'll make sure that you get it. Thank you so much for being here with us this week. We'll see you next week.